A well-planned home invasion by professional thieves fails when dad chooses not to become a victim. Stop the Threat starts now. Welcome to Stop the Threat. My name is James Toll. Our guest for this week's episode, Michael Carrizales, retired Texas police officer, senior 911 telecommunicator, as well as the lead instructor for Gander Mountain Academy in Spring, Texas. Wes Doss, founder and president of Kyber Interactive Associates. Wes has a PhD and is internationally recognized as a firearms instructor. Rob Pencus. Managing Editor of the Personal Defense Network. Welcome all. Thank you. Uh, let me start with you again, Michael, and let me ask you a little bit. Let's see, I had a question for you, and it was about personal protection officer. I understand that that is part of what you do. I am licensed by the Texas Private Security Bureau. I am licensed as a personal protection officer instructor. Um, and instructor. Instructor. Mm. AKA bodyguard. bodyguard. So I'm bodyguard instructor. A lot of that going on in Houston? Uh, a little bit, a little bit. Um, very low key. Clients don't want to acknowledge right. uh, that they need, need a hired gun type thing. Okay. All right, Wes, let me ask you this. Tell me what ECQC is. Well, it's an acronym for a program that we've developed called Extreme Close Quarters Conditioning. And uh, it is. The only true proprietary program that we've got at Kyber, and it's essentially taking all the agility, stability training that would be utilized uh, to maximize uh, elite athletes mm -hmm. and applying that to the use of force realm for either firearms, defensive tactics training. Okay, okay, that really sounds interesting. We should probably learn more about this. But Rob, I know you're doing a tour, and you do a tour every year. Yeah, every year. We start down in the uh, southeast. We start in Florida. We go up the east coast. Make a left-hand turn, go uh, you know through the Midwest, across the plains, over the mountains, and up to the Pacific Northwest every year. And uh, this year we've got a lot of instructors involved in that from the Personal Defense Network. Um, they actually are the key sponsor of the tour, and we'll uh, have over 60 classes, and I'll be at about 30, 35 of them myself. Wow. Uh, so this is an individual with you and others, or is this individual with, well, may, let me rephrase that, is this individual with you and civilians, or is this individual with you and other firearms instructors? Uh, it depends. Uh, some of the courses, uh, we've got guys who teach uh, knife defense, we've got guys who do unarmed defense, we've got uh, myself, I do primarily firearms courses, and they're open enrollment. So we might have law enforcement, military, private security, and people with concealed carry permits all on the range training together. And uh, the couple of the courses are instructor development also. Um, working with, with guys, you know, that, that are interested in, in teaching these skills to other people as well. Okay, so you're driving when yes. you're doing this? Yeah, I actually, uh, we, we get in the vehicle and we, we put the logos on it and uh, drive around the country and it's great. You know, I spend four months on the road and it, what it allows me to do is go to some ranges that they may not be able to get 12, 15, 20 people. It may be a range that hasn't hosted training before, may only have five, six, eight, ten people and it's great. It's a great environment. I'm out on the road anyway. We don't cancel classes and when people show up, we teach and uh, sometimes we, we create training communities and we create enthusiasms so that next year we go back and it's a full course. Mm. Okay, so this is a great opportunity for individuals to have some time with you directly. Absolutely. Yeah, we keep and the classes. And if they small. wanted to do that, Rob, how would they the schedule best that? Best place to go is icetraining.us. They can see my complete schedule and anything between March and July is part of the tour. Okay. Well, I have a robbery for you to, to look at today. Uh, this is probably going to go to the area of a professional robbery. And when we come back, I'll show you part one. Welcome back, viewers. Uh, we're we're going to go to Indiana, where I'm going to show you a robbery that took place there. Um, this is going to go into the file we call Professional Burglars. And I'm going to show you part one. We're going to look at that, and then we're going to talk about it before I show you part two. Roll part one. It really gets to show people what we can all accomplish as a country. And, you know, I was reminding everyone that, you know, the
say anything. All we want is your money. Don't try anything. Okay, and the reason why I say this is professional, of all the robberies we look at, I think that they have done some professional steps before. I mean, they obviously know what they're doing. These aren't the general bad guy that we see that comes rolling off the street and does something impromptu almost. Um, my feeling is these fellows are professional. They've done it before. They know what they're doing. They have a reason for being at that home. They know how to get in, and it, they may even know how to get out. What do you think? It certainly doesn't look random. It certainly looks like something that was planned. They yeah. were prepared for, for everything that they've done. Right. They get. They, get, they had the Slim Jim, right? Uh, they they smart enough to go into the car and get the garage door opener and hit the button. I mean, they didn't even go to the front door. I mean, they knew exactly what they were going to do. And then they had the, uh, I'm going to say the 10W40 uh, to use on the hinges. What do you think, Rob? Yeah, there, there's no doubt that uh, these guys really had a plan and they were executing it very well. Now, whether or not it was part of their plan that somebody was asleep on the couch, you know, you, you can't really account for that, right? So that now they're, they may be improvising. What I'll say is this. Uh, this is a reminder of just how vulnerable garages are. Yes. You know, not just garage doors that can be broken, kicked through, pried open, but also a lot of us do that. We park in front of the garage. Maybe we got the lawnmower. We got the shop table. We got a reason we're not pulling in. But we leave that garage door opener outside in the car where it's very vulnerable. And then if the interior door isn't locked, if you don't have a good secure door from the garage to the main part of the house, this is what happens. I think that was actually the key to their success, was knowing that they could access that garage door opener. What do you think, Michael? We have all used the word complacency. It is so easy to just drive home from a hard day at work, get in that garage, and leave the very valuable key to get inside the domain, that garage door opener. Right. You know, the other thing that I noticed was that he had a knife and not a gun. That kind of tells me that he's not looking for trouble, but he wants to be prepared for something. Absolutely. I mean, with, with what the, the use a firearm, go to jail laws that exist all over the country, and right. that certainly puts him out of the realm of that. With, but again, it's a deadly weapon one way or the other. But yeah, it certainly appears that way. Okay. Rob? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if they wanted to go in, if this were a home invasion, if this were a kick the door in, point guns at people, it would have been handled completely differently. Now, I don't know whether he was uh, prepared ahead of time. He wasn't walking around with the knife, but certainly when he saw the person, that's when he said, okay, let me pull a knife out and at least make the threat, that very real threat of lethal force. All right. Now, no, I agree with you when you said that I don't think they were expecting to find someone asleep on the couch. And uh, I think that may be the reason why he brought his knife with him and just in case anything or as well prepared as these guys are they might have had some other reason for that knife and just in case just, sure. we've got it we got to cut this or cut that so uh, I'm gonna put this in the professional file uh, Michael because I think these guys knew what they were doing they had the elements they had the tools uh, everything was going in their direction uh, they were trying to be very quiet about it for someone to bring WD-40 right. to make sure the hinges don't squeak uh, that's going, thinking ahead. Going back to the knife, it's like you don't want a gun to go off to awaken any neighbors or anyone else in the house. Right. And when we come back, we'll show you part two. There's more to be seen. Don't go away. Uh, viewers, we've just looked at the first part of a scenario where some professional burglars as opposed to a home invasion, came in prepared. They, I think we can safely say they studied their subject well. They were prepared. They went in. Uh, they were not anticipating any problems. And it appears as though they were hoping to get in, get out as quickly as possible. Um, and they showed that ear of professionalism um, that probably worries all of us. Now, I'm going to show you part two because there's more to be seen. Let's watch that. Get out of my house.
Hello? Oh, hello. Two men just broke into my house. I shot one of them. They both ran away. Okay. I need to go check on my family. Okay, I'll, I'll tell you right now from the beginning that I think he saw what the threat was and that it was a knife. Uh, I think the reference to the photographs on the desk uh, were about his family, of course, and he thought about his family upstairs and may have even seen that other person go upstairs. Whether or not he did it is, is not really important. He was concerned. He realized he was only facing, um, I shouldn't say only, but he was at least facing a knife as opposed to a gun. And he thought he had an opportunity to overcome, which he did. Absolutely. I think he, he acted based on, on good, solid motivation. And it seemed like a, a good, solid technique that he utilized as far as, you know, his timing and, and, and when he decided to apply it. Um, everything went very well, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Rob, what do you think? Should you shot one time? Well, you know, what's interesting is overwhelmingly we see people who use firearms for personal defense or home defense, family defense. In this case, it's a psychological stop. Right? You can put one bullet, two bullets, three bullets, 18 bullets into the air or into the bad guy. If he runs off, you did not physiologically stop him. Of course, we teach people to shoot until the threat has stopped. A psychological stop counts. The guy dropped the knife and or lowered the knife, turned and left. That's when it's time to stop shooting. And as this guy did, check the area, see if there's anybody else and focus on the family. Yeah, I don't have a problem with that. I think we're looking at people who are probably not spending as much time on the range as we mm -hmm. are, and we're, they're not as prepared as we are. However, he did have his gun out, uh, which made me think that he is at least concerned about his property, and 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 he wasn't hidden away someplace with a you know, as un, well, unobtainable. But there's a difference between unobtainable and obtainable to the bad guy. So we talked about how professional these guys were. If they were really that alert, they might have noticed the gun was sitting there, and now this guy really is in trouble uh, when he wakes up. So uh, at least some cut type of concealment. Uh, is definitely uh, advised, if not a quick access safe, which is my preference for any defensive gun. That's a good point. Okay. Um, I wonder about the time. I, I wonder if I, if I knew in my mind, and I'm going to play the devil's advocate here, if I knew in my mind I was going to have to go into the safe for the gun, um, would I have been quite as aggressive, not knowing whether or not I can get that safe open? Uh, what do you think? I think that's where you train. That's where you train, and that's why we use a quick access safe with just some large buttons and or a biometric. One of the things I tell people is that if, if you're in a wrestling match with somebody, you probably shouldn't be turning your back to reach for the gun anyway, right? He had caused enough disruption to the bad guy's plan and affected him enough to create space to get to the gun. Right. So he was already in a little bit more control than he was when he was on the couch. If he'd had to get into a safe, he'd had, he'd, he would have needed to create even more control before he went to the gun. But at the end of the day, my bigger concern is that that gun ends up in the bad guy's hand and you get woken up at the point of your own muzzle. Yeah, I think there was some luck involved there uh, that the bad guys did not see that gun, Michael, and, and maybe take it for themselves. Um, what do you think? The, the old cliche, he came to a gunfight with a knife. Um, the guy, obviously, the homeowner obviously saw the advantage that, hey, this guy overlooked the gun. There it is on the nightstand. All he's got to contend with is a knife. I, if I get to it, I'm going for it. He saw the pictures of his family, and it's like, this guy's not going to hurt my family. I'm going to protect the family. Right. So, he, he made that impulsive decision, and we saw the results. Yeah. I, I don't think, I, I don't have a real problem with anything that he did. Um, as I think about it in my mind, uh, uh, being concerned for his family, having the weapon out, having the weapon out exposed like that, yeah, okay, maybe he was cleaning it and forgot to put it away, but you know, I'm not going to think that. I'm going to think more along the lines of he felt uh, comfortable having it out that he could get access to it, and I think that bolstered his confidence in being aggressive with the intruder and getting to that gun. I mean, I don't know how else. Now, should he have shot once? Should he have shot twice? I, I don't know. I think any of us here at the table, we might have run off a couple of more rounds, but as you said, he did at least, I'm not going to say stop the threat, but he turned the threat away from him. And I'm a little concerned uh, only when the guy comes down the stairs 
the bang, 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 he coming down. Is it his family or is it a bad guy? He turned, you know, he kind of, there was a little bit of a gap in there that I had a problem with, I'm not sure about. But when we come back, we'll talk more about it. Welcome back, viewers. We have seen what I would like to call a professional robbery. Uh, we've seen a resident successfully end that robbery. Now, my question is, and I'm going to ask you this, Wes, did he do everything he should have to secure the home? I mean, I mean, would you not wonder if there was a third person? That's a fantastic question. In fact, you must have been reading my mind. Because he, when he, he dispatched the, the, the second guy and he left, he immediately put the pistol in his waistband right. and then picked up the phone. There's a dog leg to get back out to that garage. I certainly would have expected him to make sure that the threat was clear of the premises or still was on premises before putting that weapon back in some inoperable condition in his waistband. Right, yeah, that, I think that's probably what I noticed too. He put it away, put it away rather quickly and went to 911 without knowing if the, I mean, I guess I would have locked the door. I would have gone upstairs. I would have seen, is the family okay, Rob? Yeah, I mean, absolutely, you want to make contact, but one of the first things that we talk about in any of our home defense stuff is that you evade, hide, barricade, arm, and then the next step is going to be to make contact. Well, obviously, he had already armed himself, but he hadn't done anything to secure his position, that, that evade, hide, and barricade step. Mm -hmm. So, so you got to start that over. So yeah, you've stopped an, an immediate threat, but those guys could still be around the corner. We're not sure about the family. Grab the cell phone, but we teach people to make that 911 call with the firearm in the ready position. Once it's out, let's keep it out till we know we're secure. Okay, Michael, is the 911 call, when is it going to occur here? When should it have occurred, have occurred? Well, one likes to get it in as quickly as possible so that we can summon the police because uh, there's always that word that police take forever. Well, 30 seconds is forever whenever you're in that predicament. Um, but we'll let's secure what we have um, at present. At present, we have the house. At present, we have the family. Let's make sure that we're secure. Uh, in identifying your earlier question. If there's one, there's two. If there's two, there's three. We see two actually take in, uh, commit the action. Where is their driver? How did they get there? Uh, we're, we didn't get to see that part. Uh, yeah, and, and from the point of view of the resident, I mean, he really never had the opportunity to look. I mean, he was kind of woken up. By that time, five guys could have been around the house. Exactly. So he never knew that. And I'm going to kind of go back to what Wes was saying, was that I think he probably should have secured the premises, gone and locked the door first, so they gone don't upstairs, get back yes. checked on the family. What's the rush on 911? I mean, don't you have to do a couple of things first? Well, I'm going to say that there's a difference between checking on the family and securing the house. We don't generally advocate that people run around the house trying to secure the premises. He's safe right now. He needs to move to the family, get with them, secure themselves in that bedroom. And if the guy's around the corner or the guy's rummaging through the garage, who cares? He doesn't need to chase bad guys. He needs to go check on them. No, no, no. I, I don't think it's necessary to chase the bad guy, but I think I probably would have gone and locked the door. No, but then you've got to go around that corner, and he could be standing okay, right there you waiting get, for yeah, you. Well, all right. Oh, okay. okay. I, I guess my thought would have been to secure the door, go check on the family, then make the 911 call. And we I've don't know. He could have kicked the door in. It could, he couldn't. Maybe he can't secure it. We don't know. But we know the family's upstairs. Okay. Michael, i got just a few seconds. Tell me. Save the family. Save the family. That's, That's what I That's the most do. valuable I'm, assets. Right. And 911 call can be made at any point in time after, after you feel secure enough that you can devote the attention necessary to 911. Right. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, I appreciate all of you coming in. I think your experience here is, is very valuable. And viewers, if you have any comments, feel free to contact me. Uh, again, I will leave you with this. The only gunfight you win is the one you do not get into. See you next week. Be safe, be trained, be alert.